Good evening and welcome to the Comics Experience Graphic Level of the Month Club meeting for the month of December. Uh, this is our last meeting for the year. Aww. Um, but, but yeah, but it's, it's good because we're ending with a really good one. We're ending with this amazing book. Oh my God. Maestros by Steve Stros. Whoa. Oh, that's a response I love to hear. Wow. Wow, and we're really, really happy to be joined here live in the store uh, with Steve Scross himself. Welcome. Oh, thank you. Thanks for coming, man. Thanks. Oh, nice. Thanks for coming out. It's like Live Aid out here. Yeah, yeah, coming from the wilds of Canada. Yeah. Uh, oh, and let's uh, let's thank our sponsor, The Beat. I should always do that at the beginning of the show, shouldn't I? It's the right thing to do. www.comicsbeat.com. Go there. It's the best site for news and comics information, and I'm not kidding. I love that site. I do as well. It's a good site. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, this is a great book. Um, and I'm, I, I've been watching your work for a long time. You've been doing comics 25, 30 years at least, Jeez, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Something like that, yeah. Yeah, so. Little breaks, but yeah. Yeah, so question one, why comics? What's, what's it about comics? It, it, <clears throat> um. Well, I just, I didn't have anything else going on, so, uh, <laughs> but, well, it's always been comics, you know, since I was a little kid, um, 80s kid, grew up uh, on that, uh, you know, the media diet in those early days was, you know, I, I walked into a, a swap meet kind of uh, school gym con convention, comic convention, and I picked up like, you know, Frank Miller's Daredevil and the Paul Smith, um, Claremont X-Men run, and the Dark Knight, and the Killing Joke, all this stuff that had been out, like, all in like one day. Mm -hmm. And so that just infected my little brain. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. yeah, pretty much there were no other alternatives, really. Yeah. It wasn't like, you know, oh, I go, I, I'll go back to taxidermy school or something. It was pretty much just comics. And were you drawing your own comics then as a kid? Oh yeah, yeah, I was uh, constantly drawing the Marvel and DC characters and, uh, you know, sending in submissions since I was, you know, like 11. Really? Oh, yeah, yeah. And they were pretty cool. I'd, I'd always get, generally I would get a little rejection letter, but there'd be something friendly, a uh, little note on there by someone. And as I got a little better, um, you know, Carl Potts would send, uh, who was an editor at the time, sent me like a Xerox cinematography book for me to look at. and. Uh, I don't think I even understood it. <laughs> right. I was like, there's no Batman in this. What am I supposed to do with this? <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But uh, eventually it started to click, yeah. Do you, do you have any of those, those old rejection letters still? Did you keep any they're of them? Stick, they're, they're, they're around somewhere in a box, for sure. That's neat. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I hoard things, so, yeah. 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 What's, uh, how, did, how did you break in then? Well, actually, no. But did, did you, the first question is, is did you study art in school is, or what what was your schooling yes yes during math class i studied uh you know jim lee and uh, hmm. rob liefeld and mm -hmm, uh, all mm -hmm. that that was my that was my um education no formal training really um it was kind of just a the earn while you learn program um i got in during a time where there was this massive boom that you know you've heard of and so they would hire anyone really and uh back in those days before social media you had to you know in my case hop in your yugo and drive from vancouver british columbia to san diego with all these little xeroxed packets of your artwork to show the various editors that would be hanging around the marvel booths and uh, dc booths or whatever publisher valiant at that time and uh yeah hopefully you'd get a call and that's kind of what happened i met an editor there that ultimately <coughs> called me for my first job through me just handing him this little package of uh, xeroxes so yeah and that was very exciting yeah did you did you go to school to study art no no not at all you're self-taught uh yeah sort of i mean um i guess so like along the way um i sort of got into comics and then i after, I don't know, how long was I at Marvel? A few years, I got to do some movie work and, you know, getting, I got exposed to 
other artists, specifically, you know, one of the lucky strikes of my early creative life was uh, I got to work on the Matrix films, um, and uh, I was put in a room with Jeff Darrow, which, um, and honestly, he gave me like my basic fundamental drawing lessons. Because I could draw, but back then it was mostly about eyeballing. I had no uh, real understanding of perspective and depth or composition. I was just kind of like, you know, I kind of just had like this um, reference box of images in my brain that I would use to, you know, tell a comic story if I could or would do these storyboards. And uh, if you look at some of those early Matrix storyboards, uh, some of them are a little, a little wacky because the uh, perspective doesn't line up. There'd be no way to shoot some of those things. But, um, but yeah, um, that was one of the, that was sort of the, the beginning of it. And then from there, you just sort of, um, you know, we're talking, I'm like 18, 19, 20 years old, 22 years old, and uh, just <clears throat> going to the comic store and discovering artists and uh, just, you know, learning from looking at it and, and trying things and that sort of stuff, yeah. Yeah, that's, 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 Kind of amazing in a way. I actually have to say because I, you know, we've this is the third year of the book club, so that means we've talked to uh, 30, 70, 2, 75 different creators. I think you're the first person who's like, no, I have no formal training of any kind. That's, well, that's, that's kind of cool. I didn't go to a school, but I mean, winding up in a room with Jeff Darrow oh, was sure. pretty no, no, lucky. Oh, sure. No, no, absolutely. No, absolutely. <clears throat> yeah. Absolutely. Um, so the, or, yeah. the the first job you were offered at Marvel, uh, was it one of the X-Books or? No, they had um, they had this series uh, back then. Like I said, it was a huge boom, selling in huge numbers. So Clive Barker, the horror novelist, mm -hmm. wanted to get in on that. And he created four concepts that would be the basis of his own line of um, comics. The Barkerverse. Uh, the, yes, called the Razor Line. Yep. And, uh, yep. you know, so I got hired on one of those. The artist who was going to do it quit, and then I got called, and and I got, um, yeah, got to um, work in the, the big leagues, as it were, early on. Um, That's a pretty heady thing to be doing at that young age, yeah? Yeah, no, totally. Like, you know, I was like 18 years old. I was clicking my heels. It was just like the best thing that had ever happened. And um, it's also where I worked. Uh, I worked, James Robinson was the initial writer on this Ecto Kid book. And um, then he quit for Greener Pastures. And the replacement writer were the uh, Wachowski siblings. And that's how I began my relationship with them who went on to make uh, the Matrix trilogy, among many other things. And uh, they, you know, we just had a rapport and they liked me and they kind of gave this dumb kid a chance to go do storyboards, which was really a terrible choice on their part because I had no skills. But, uh, but yeah, it was pretty cool. That's where that all began. Yeah, yeah. Ecto Kid was nine issues? Is that yeah, right? wow, you got a good memory. Well, yeah, I mean, I, <clears throat> I was selling them back in the day. Yeah, I, well. You know. <laughs> <You're>, <laughs> but there's a lot of books come through here. When you're a comic realist retailer, yeah. you tend to remember everything. Yeah. Um, uh, and I do remember as well, and I'm, I'm, this is not puffery, but I remember that Ecto Kid was, to me, the one of the four books that actually stood out as having something behind it as opposed to just we're cashing a paycheck to make Clive Barker happy. I know? think everyone was trying uh, their hardest and uh, but you know we had the you know the Wachowskis you know they were uh, a cut above and um, they worked hard and uh, you know they were very visually literate and uh, just literate in general and they had all sorts of you know highbrow and lowbrow influences and uh, yeah it was pretty fun. Yeah. Now, this was when Barker was a monster at, at that moment. Yeah, like, it was like culturally. the peak. It was the yeah. peak, right? Yeah, Hellraiser had come out, right? I think the, had been a, it had been a series of films at that point. Mm, there had okay. been a bunch of them. Okay. And uh, yeah. we even had a little, right before the whole thing collapsed, it's funny, the sales in those books now would be considered, well, pretty good sales. Sure, sure, but sure. But they were canceled back in those days. And uh, But we got to do a little Barker Summit after San Diego mm -hmm. and Marvel brought everyone on, we sat and we were going to do this big crossover with those things, and uh, but it never happened. But uh, I got to meet Clive, which was fun. Yeah, really cool. Yeah, he's also a big comics guy. Yeah, 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 very, uh, yeah, very yeah. much at that time. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, had the Wachowskis, the Wachowskis hadn't 
done anything at that point, had they? When we had done that summit, uh, they had just sold uh, their first screenplay, uh, Assassins, which wound up being this Richard Donner movie starring Stallone and uh, Antonio Banderas. <coughs> and Sharon Stone, I think, might, may have been in that. I vaguely remember that. Yeah, yeah. Kind of came and went. But that got their foot in the door, and... Um, yeah, and uh, yeah, from there they carried on and, you know, they worked on a bunch of different stuff and uh, they had this script, The Matrix, kicking around and they were trying to get it uh, sold in Hollywood. Well, it had been sold, but people really didn't understand it, you know, and uh, they had this idea, of, let's bring in a couple artists and the, we will get them to do storyboards and concept drawings that they could ultimately take to Terry Semmel, who was the president of Warner Brothers production at the time, and just have this big book that they would flip open and they could take him through what happens in the movie. Mm -hmm. And this is this, and uh, that's what we produced. Um, you know, that first time, that's what we produced. It was actually, the, I worked on The Matrix like, uh, for a couple years, you know, it's probably like a year's worth of work over like three years, where you would they would go and they would pitch it and then they would get a little bit more development money and they would come back they had a, they had an office and uh, they would uh, had more artists and more of a production and then they would work on that a little bit more and then pitch it again and uh, try to convince them to um, fund the whole film and then that would fall over and uh, ultimately the whole time I worked on it with the, my last day on the original Matrix you know it was not going to be made no one was interested and uh, I went home and then like three months later they got Keanu Reeves involved and uh, you know just sort of steamrolled from there yeah, yeah. Uh, so you weren't you weren't doing um, uh, storyboards originally you were just sort of doing visualizations of the ideas? well they were storyboards for sure okay. um, but like I think they call it the keyframes so okay. it wouldn't be you know sort of the trailer moments that uh, that wound up in this kind of big coffee table sized ringed binder that they would like flip through and they would have big frames in there and you would have Jeff Darrow's artwork and my artwork and uh, you know as time came by other artists would be uh, included and uh, you know and then once that was done you know then uh, and they got um, approval then uh, other boards were done and figured out and yeah move, move along. And at, and at that stage and I just only because I'm curious sure. because they weren't anyone then and yeah and you were not anyone then. Were you doing this work on spec? Were you doing it? Oh, for... no, they were paying me. Yeah. They had okay. War Warner's, you know, it was like, you know, back then there was like way more money in show business. So they had a lot of, and they still kind of, they still do a lot of movies in some level of production, you know, like uh, when we first started in The Matrix, it was just me and Jeff Darrow and uh, us doing drawings. And uh, we were working out of our hotel rooms in LA. And then the second time we came out, they had some offices. Uh, and they had a couple other artists, and there was a produ pr another a line producer involved who would, you know, who was like figuring out budgets and stuff. And uh, there were more people, and then the third time there were even more people. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. But uh, but yeah, it was still this battle to try to convince people. Yeah, because Warner's at that time were making movies like Assassins, you know, these sort of straightforward action movies, and they're like, you know, The Matrix is uh, an old movie now, uh, but uh, back then it was the weirdest thing anyone had ever heard of. Yeah. Like, you know, so how did they get from the city to under the ground. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, those are the kind of questions mm -hmm. people people mm -hmm. had. <laughs> mm -hmm. Did you did you know what you were working on, or were you just trying to do your best? Does um, that make sense? This question. Yeah, I mean, like, uh, well, I was so young and so like st awestruck to be just involved in this in any way. Like, uh, what was I thinking back then? I mean, it seemed cool. I mean, everyone, when you're on a movie and you're working on it, everyone kind of feels, I don't know, generally speaking, uh, for me, they have been good experiences and most people, most, most people aren't going, ah, oh, this is shit. I mean, uh, on Matrix, the Wachowskis have this great, one of their great talents is um, they really make everyone else working around them feel very excited about the project they're working on and their contribution, uh, you know, uh, everyone feels very valued, uh, you know, all the, all the other creative people they're working with. So. Um, so yeah, no, we were on a high for sure. It was a great experience. But, you know, no one knew it would become what it had be became. Well, sure. I mean, especially because you said you didn't think it was going to get made. Well, they told me, they just told us that because, yeah. you know, you would finish, they would run out of money and send everyone home and, yeah. and uh, then you're just kind of in turnaround again 
which means like it may be one of the movies that may be made, but it was such a, um, um, you know, uh, there was just no, no certainty. You know, they kind of keep you guessing up until the, the last minute, until you're like on set. Yeah. Uh, you don't really know if the movie's going to fall over yet. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And so then you get the call that it's being made. What's the transition then? Well, that was cool. At that point, I was back in one was they were actually filming. I went out to visit, visit, and that was pretty cool, seeing it produced and all of Darrow's drawings, uh, you know, realized in, in, in real life and uh, actors and costumes being made. It was pretty, pretty amazing. Um, and then you just hope it, uh, you know, but I'm back at Marvel working on whatever it was. Maybe it was, what was I doing? Cable? Maybe it was Cable. Maybe it was after that or X-Man. Yeah. Maybe Amazing Spider-Man. Right. I would have been in the mix there. Right. You're right. I'm so old now. I can't exactly remember. No, no, no. I mean, I know what you mean because there was a, that's a I think it was Spider-Man. I mean, Marvel was very cool. At one point, they let me leave Spider-Man and then come back, which was super cool of them, mm -hmm. uh, to work on this movie. And... Uh, I think they had like Joel Silver call Bob Harris or something like that yeah. uh, and work it out. Um, but yeah, you didn't really know. And even when it even when it came out, you weren't really. It was like one of those movies that uh, came out and then kind of uh, caught fire. People just oh, you got to go see this movie. People were talking about it, and yeah, yeah. I think it was a few months before we realized oh, this is this has it had long legs too. Mm -hmm. It uh, kind of came out in. Didn't have a gigantic weekend, but like every weekend, people kept turning up, and mm -hmm, mm -hmm, I think, mm -hmm. you know, but yeah, the good old days. Yeah, that matches my memory more or less of the time. Yeah. Um, there was a fairly large gap between the first movie and the second movie. It's, it was a couple years, something yeah. like that, and they had a very long development period for the sequels because and they were... two and three were back to back. Back to back, yeah. so yeah, it was a gigantic, we were, I was away from home for like... A couple of years or something, working on these things, and yeah. uh, they filmed here in the Bay Area, and they filmed uh, L.A., and um, ultimately it ended up in in uh, Sydney, Australia, and uh, yeah. So, yeah, The Matrix was good to me. How sure. how different was the experience on the second one compared to the first? Right, because oh, you know, well, the first you you don't know what you're doing, and it's not even a movie yet, and they're changing things. The second one, though. It's like this, it's got to be this much oh, larger yeah. scale, right? And you've got to get all the storyboards and everything correct the first time, it seems to me. Yeah, well, there was just way more money to burn from, you know, it had become a big hit, and so they felt comfortable to spend money on things. So you would, you know, initially, I think Darrow and I were sharing this, like, the absolute cheapest economy car, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, in the original movie. Uh, going back and forth to the Oakwoods, which was this corporate housing. And then, like, for the sequels, you know, we were in, like, really nice apartments. Everyone had, like, a, their own nice car. You know, the per diem was nice. You know, on that level, it was, like, a lot more luxury, probably more than you would even have today because this was, like, you know, DVD was huge. It was just a, a, a bit of a, a golden age. You know, the Internet hadn't, uh, you know, we didn't have the thievery yet. You know, and all that, and uh, so yeah, it was yeah. The scale was huger. There was also the expectation, but it was just great to be kind of in the middle of all that. Yeah. You know. Yeah. No, I imagine so. And we all they also had built at that point they had built some of their own offices in Venice, so there was sort of these the, this uh, posh um, office that you're working in that had like, you know, you'd walk in and you'd have the Matrix chairs were right there. Mm -hmm. The lobby looked like the white, you know. Um, space in the, the you know where the the construct i guess is what it was called in the film and yeah well he wasn't there yet that came later but uh <coughs> the closet of weapons yeah exactly space, yeah. so they were it had this like yeah they were yeah there was so much uh uh money being thrown around for that kind of stuff it was pretty uh, pretty amazing yeah to watch i feel like a lot of those movies a lot of the language is straight out of comics. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, definitely for sure. Uh, the themes. I mean, e you know, even the really small stuff like Neo just doing the Superman pose at the end, and uh, and so how much of that was, from your point of view? I mean, as as a storyboarder, how much of that was conscious? How much of that was 
serendipitous, I suppose. Mm, well, I think it's, you know, there, they had, at that point they were, they had read everything and were into cyberpunk and, um, you know, they're voracious readers and, uh, you know, cinephiles and all the rest. And, uh, yeah, they wanted to. They loved kung fu movies. And so it was like all this stuff going on that was kind of, I guess it was sort of fringe at that time, um, that was part of their media diet and their, their influences. And they just kind of mixed it all together. And, it, and, and that's what it was, you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. coming out the other side. So its influences were very, very broad. You know, mm -hmm. they, it had this uh, sort of intellectual, philosophical component. <clears throat> And uh, yeah, and then there were obviously the Kung Fu and then you, Neo's flying around. There's the superhero stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, um, and then it's got this post-apocalyptic vibe with Zion and uh, the destroyed Earth. And uh, it had really been kind of, it was a, a really potent hybrid yeah. that no one had really seen before, I guess. Yeah. I, I specifically wonder like in terms of two the, there's two set pieces there which to me are are hold up today for when probably will forever and oh, yeah. agent smith and the big battle in the courtyard and then oh, yeah. and then the freeway fight you know like both of the, those are very long sequences yeah very i have to assume they're very 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 storyboarded out at that point yeah, pretty much, pretty much. They're storyboarded and then they're previs, which is when you take the storyboards and then you'll go and make these uh, animatics, which are kind of um, pretty much what you're going to see on film, but it's, you know, they all, it kind of looks like, you know, PS1 animation or PS2 animation, you know. Um, but yeah, yeah, every every detail was, was pretty much figured out. And, uh, but I'm sure there's improvisation that happens on the day and, and everything else oh, as oh, well. Oh, sure, yeah. sure. But when you're, Dealing with things that are sort of that tightly constructed, it strikes me that the yeah. storyboard becomes kind of the defining document, more than the script in a way, right? Well, or am I wrong about that? No, I think so, because I mean, the storyboard ultimately is a tool that everyone uses. It's a blueprint for what they're going to make. They can look at these, these drawings, and uh, if that's really what the, they want, which was the case that I was doing pretty much full comic book art storyboard and uh, storyboards. And so, yeah, the, based on the boards, you, they could determine what needed to be cut, um, how much it would cost, you know, uh, inform, you know, how the actors were directed and everything else. And I was extensively directed a lot of, um, you know, I was everything, all of that stuff comes from them, especially in those, mm -hmm. those early days. I was really like their hand, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. really. Mm -hmm. Um, their their pencil and uh, yeah, they were very specific and had very very clear ideas. Uh, since then, working on other movies, it is not like that. A lot of the times, a lot of the times you're working on a film, even big budget films, and you're more kind of like uh, idea mining, where like you're almost like the scout and the rest of the production is the army and the storyboard artist is the scout who gets sent ahead to kind of like you know, see what the best, pa best path for the army is. So you'll go out and you'll go into a direction and, and come up with a bunch of stuff and that may not be what they use. And then you'll have to come back and then find another path. And, uh, you know, uh, you're, you're always sort of, uh, you're there to kind of come up with ideas and not just determine what's going to be filmed, but what's not going to happen, mm -hmm. you know, as mm -hmm. well, you know, experiment in, in paper rather than, uh, you know, rolling film and sure, actors sure. and all that. Sure, sure. No, that makes a lot of sense, yeah. yeah. So, um, how long was the production process, uh, particularly in, in light of those kinds of scenes, the Agent Smith scene and the... Because and, it just, it strikes me that that maybe you you did those and redid those multiple times to get them honed down to the... It could actually be shot and filmed because otherwise it's impossible almost. Well, it's funny, you know, with those, that is generally how it, how it works. It's multiple times, and that's probably really tough about um, uh, working on, on a movie is that, yeah, I mean, there's been movies where I've done one scene for six months, and, uh, you know, by the end of it, you it's, it's you kind of don't want to draw it anymore. And uh, with The Matrix, it was almost like working with doing comics in a way because they had such specific clear ideas. They would just come in, we'd have these meetings and they would like, sometimes they'd have little sketches or they'd just say, well, maybe we're going to do a shot of this and a shot of that. And then I would do a sketch and then they would be like, kind of like this. And they would go, yeah, and uh, or no. And then uh, 
after the meeting, I'd go up and draw it up, and it would pretty much land where they were thinking. If there were okay. changes, we would we would make them. But uh, yeah, but I remember that process being yeah pretty pretty much from their uh, from their from their head is what wound up on on the screen. And when you're trying to visualize these scenes in space, because they're very constrained scenes, it's, it seems to me. Sure. I mean, the, the freeway scene is on a whole freeway, but it's still within the boundaries. It's a straight shot, yeah, mostly, yeah, yeah. yeah. And so how much physicality do you have in that? How much are you kind of like in a space trying to figure out how that works? Does that make sense? Well, I, you know, I understand. What I'm you asking get. it as a comics person rather than as a film person. I, I, well, let's see. Well, generally in a movie, yeah, sometimes that, that can be, I've worked on other movies, that's very challenging. But again, with The Matrix, they had such specific ideas where it'd be like, you know, they went and designed that freeway and the production designer, I would just go over to this model that they built. And sometimes they would have uh, digital photo shots of the angles that they wanted. And I would just draw those up, mm. you know. Um, whereas now it's, it's, it's less like that. Um, or never like that, really. Um, yeah, it's sort of just now, generally with the storyboards, like a lot of the drawings I'll do on a movie, you know, may not even look like what the final shot is, but it's kind of captures an idea of the moment that they want to, that they want to film. Sure. You know, and uh, so it's less specific. And then as they get closer to creating it practically or digitally, it gets honed down and honed down by really a series of people from you know maybe starting with me and then to previs and then stunts and right. all these people kind of weigh in and figure out the logistics and um, that idea gets honed and refined. Yeah. But in the Matrix in those days, the Wachowskis had super specific ideas and pretty much everyone was you know um, you would get a very uh, you would get a, an answer a very clear answer very quickly mm -hmm. with them, mm -hmm. which, which is pretty cool. So sometime after this. They decided to build a comics company, Burly Man. Yes, which was actually uh, the Matrix films. Like when your movie is shooting, uh, they'll usually have like a secret name for it, so that you know, with signs everywhere, so the people can, um, the other people from the production can find where it is. And so that was the Matrix's, the sequel's secret name was Burly Man Productions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so they made that the comic book company. And uh, yeah, we uh, we kind of dropped the ball a little bit with Burly Man. But uh, we put out a few comics. Um, the yeah, one, you did Doc Frankenstein. And Doc Darrow did did Shaolin, Shaolin yeah. Cowboy for mm -hmm. a couple of years. And Doc Frankenstein has a an additional sixty five plus pages that have never been seen that are totally finished. Wow. That wow. Uh, that completes the story. Uh huh. And we just haven't haven't gotten around to they haven't gotten around to putting it out. But uh, okay. I feel like there's a pretty good chance maybe. But who knows? It could come out maybe next year, but we'll see. Nice. Yeah. Nice. I would love awesome. to see that. Yeah, I would love to yeah, see that. Yeah, we need to see, yeah. it, see it finished. But it's like, if you're going to make a kind of, you know, you kind of really got to be in it, but it was more kind of, you know, hanging. It was more kind of like, you know, what, um, I don't know. We, we lost focus. We did other, you know, got into movies and stuff. And it couldn't, you can't make a comic company that's just a uh, hobby. You kind of got to be really. You know, you, you've got to support those retailers and deliver the books, and we, sure. weren't, we weren't doing that. Sure. Yeah. No, I wasn't looking to criticize <laughs> you on on that at all. <laughs> thanks uh, a lot. Thanks for digging that up. <laughs> no, I mean, because look, I'm I, just, I, I'm just I, kidding. I remember selling a lot of those comics too. I mean, oh, I just—it's my own really guilt. I'm not genuinely I, excited by that material. I didn't think you so. were. I didn't think you were doing that. It's yeah, just—it's yeah. just like yeah. this because I get asked about it all the time. Anytime I'm in any kind of comics thing, it's like, hey, when's Doc Frankenstein? I'm like, well, it's been finished for ten years. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And it's like I would like to see it come out, but. It's possible. Yeah, I'm just, I, you know, because I'm always interested in the genesis of these things, and then, and then when things don't work, sort of the postmortem of like, well, why didn't that work? You know? Um, yeah, it's so funny. Yeah, it was just kind of like, uh, in between this movie, I'll get another five pages <laughs> done, and then oh, we got to get them colored. Oh, that colorist quit because we haven't given him any any work in six months. You know what I mean? Sure. And he's off to others. He's too busy. Well, we got to find another guy. Sure. And the whole company was just one, um, you know, on the publishing, printing side, was just one guy and his uh, girlfriend, uh, you know, were doing it. And, um, you know, that's not really like a, a marketing team there. Yeah. Uh, 
but it was fun while it lasted, and I think the last one will come out. And yeah, yeah. well, and I also imagine there's, I mean, there's a big difference in pay between working on a movie and doing a comic book, right? Uh, yes, uh, unless you're working with Brian Vaughn. Yeah, but uh, okay. gen generally, generally that's true. Okay. I would, I would, yeah, yeah, definitely. You got that weekly uh, check on a movie coming in. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But, and does that change, like, your hunger to get the pages on? And again, well, I'm not looking for a criticism. I'm just, oh, I know, I'm, I know. I'm curious about. Well, for me, the trajectory for me was like, yeah, like, I'm going. You know, it, it was when you're younger in life. When I was younger, it was a great life. You got to travel. I got to go around, and I worked on a lot of these cool movies. I had the camaraderie. It was really great working with other artists. There was a camaraderie. You'd go and work on location somewhere, and it was very exciting. And uh, you were friends with all these guys. And uh, you'd get you would you would do you'd be there for you know a f months together, and uh, and it would be great. And then like as time passed, it just I just didn't like doing it as much. I re you know the the thing I always wanted to do was comics, and um, you know. The sidetrack into movies was great, uh, but you know, ultimately, when the, the time came, a chance to get back in, you know, I jumped at it, and I really, really would rather stay doing that, yeah. you know, and try to make that work, even if it is less dough. Um, you know, I'm a comics guy. It's sure. like, uh, you know, and working at Image and getting to do your own thing, you just can't. You ask yourself, you get older, and you ask yourself, well, how do you want to spend your days? And if you've got this opportunity to make your own own thing. And uh, see how that goes. Then, well, I don't know. For me, I got to take that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, uh, I totally yeah. agree. But uh, but the movies are great. You never, you know, never say never again, for yeah. sure. But uh, right now, I'm doing the image thing. Yeah. yeah. So um, between Doc Frankenstein and We Can Never Go Home, was there anything? Did, did I miss it? Uh, well, there was We Stand on. Yeah, after that. Oh, sorry, no. not We Can Never Go Home. We Stand on Guard. Oh, right, right. Um, oh, sorry. Oh, that's okay. Yeah. Uh, Too many comics. Was there anything else? Yeah. Um, in comics, not really. Uh, and then I just did the stand. We stand on guard and Maestros. It was pretty much it. Yeah. Okay. So. Where but there were movies and things in there. You sure. know. So so where did we stand on guard? What's the genesis of? Well, that I had. Project? Well, that was uh, sort of connected with the Wachowskis. Uh, they had finished making um, Jupiter Ascending. Mm -hmm. And they really liked Brian, and so they had a screening of like a very early rough cut of Jupiter Ascending, and they invited me down. Uh, they screened it at the Warner's lot, and Brian lives in L.A. and is a TV has been a TV film writer in between comics as well, and he was there, and uh, you know I was like, oh, that's Brian Vaughn. I'm gonna go chat him up, and so I just went over there and we started talking, and in a way our career trajectories, you know, even though he's a writer, we still had that kind of, he was also a comics guy, loved comics, but he had sidetracked into the film world with Lost and then running, uh, being the executive producer on that, on the Dome, and mm -hmm. he'd written some screenplays, and so he he had been in that world as well, and was also like, oh, comics, that's really where it's at, and, um, you know, he had, he was obviously at that point very successful with Saga, mm -hmm. and yeah. So we just I was just bothering him basically at this uh, par party for most of the most of the night, and um, yeah, I think at the end of the night he was like, well, yeah, if you want to ever do a comic or something, and uh, was trying trying to leave, and then you know basically I just dove at his feet and mm -hmm. grabbed his leg as he tried to scooch out the front door and he but he couldn't go anywhere until I got his email yeah. and then uh, yeah and then eventually uh, just to get rid of me we did we stand on guard yeah very good maybe 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 that's not the right way to, to, to paint it but uh, but yeah no he was a very sweet guy and uh, yeah we we hooked up later and uh, yeah that yeah. was the next the next thing and, and we stand on guard is is a very Canadian comic uh, what was the impetus from that because Brian's not Canadian. He has had a, his wife is Canadian right. and his children have dual citizenship. Okay. And he strangely has just had a weird relationship with, most of his collaborators have been Canadian. Uh, Pia Guerra, uh, who wrote, uh, who drew we the, Why the Last Man is Canadian. And coincidentally, we went to the same high school together. Really? Yeah. And wow. she's like, yeah, like a year. Yeah, so we, we knew each other from that. And I think, I forget the fellows, he's had a couple other Canadian collaborators who I'm drawing blanks on right now. 
But anyway, it was a big part of his life, Canadians, and um, uh, you know, so I, I think this is just an idea that came to him naturally when his, okay. he said when his wife had to, uh, became an American citizen and had to pledge allegiance, there was some sort of line about having to take up arms against foreign enemies, and that included Canada now. Mm -hmm. And that kind of, it was like maybe the, uh, the germ for the, the yeah. beginning of the series. Yeah. 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 So then comes Maestros. Yes. Which is your gig. You're writing this, you're drawing this, the whole thing. All my start fault. To finish. Yep. Yeah, so walk us through this process a little bit. Uh, how, what's the pitch? How do, you, how do you launch a comic book? Huh. Uh, let's see. I don't know the answer to any of those questions, but. Uh, well, you did it, so you. <laughs> but I just. I still don't know. <laughs> but. Uh, yeah, Image was just really good. I was still in comics. Brian, we did the six issue, issue series, and you know he was like, uh, you know, moving on to other things. But he encouraged me to do it, and Image was very cool. Eric Stevenson over there was like, uh, who we had had a, a, a shorter relationship uh, working on um, at uh, Awesome Comics. Rob Liefeld had this, this comic company for a little while, so he let me. Uh, he said you can do it, and so. I had actually always been dreaming of coming back to comics, so I had like this big book of like things I will do one day, you know, but was a little too chicken to actually jump into it. And I figured this was the time. And so I took one of my little projects, which was Maestro's, and decided to flesh that out and, uh, and, and see if I could, you know, make a go of that. Mm -hmm. And I just sort of put everything that I, you know, loved about fantasy and action adventure and, uh, and uh, in this big soup, and, and that's kind of what it is, yeah. So how, how long ago did you have this idea? Oh, like 2000. Well, it was funny because it's evolved. And initially, I always like the, the, the germ of that is really a, is kind of a, a fantasy story um, where the main character was like from our world who had like kind of awareness of the, um, the tropes of the genre and would kind of call them out a little bit and uh, that's kind of where that character came from, and it was a little bit irreverent of, of the whole of the whole thing. But initially, it was more of a sword and horse story with kind of a dark lord and and that kind of thing. And then uh, I kind of came ac uh, across the idea of making him sort of the, a prince, kind of the black sheep of this, you know, wizarding dynasty would be would be fun. And the story was going to begin at this funeral for his father, you know, and uh, but then once you start to boil down your ideas and fit them into those 22 pages you start to have to make quicker decisions and you know you know how many scenes do i want to have um you know i want uh, you know how much content do i want to squeeze into those pages and so that started to help me just sort of carve away what i really wanted from what i thought i wanted you know mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and uh you know and so that's that's where that came from yeah and along with you know I don't know, I really like the idea, idea of doing some dirty jokes in there as well, mm -hmm. having some, uh, a little irreverent. I got it, I'm a big um, fantasy reader, but um, I never grew up reading like Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit. I mean, they were around, but I didn't come to them until like my 20s, so I was a little more, I, was, I didn't revere them the way so many people do, mm -hmm. you know, so, <clears throat> so I liked, you know, things like, you know, I like gaming, and uh, I would, you know, read interviews and try to find out what, if they referenced something, or I would try to dig that up and read that, and I sort of discovered this writer called Jack Vance, mm -hmm. if you know him. I didn't, Absolutely. when I was a kid, so like, the, a lot of the wizards in this are kind of, uh, kind of have a, a, you know, a bit of the Jack Vanceian weirdness, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. They weren't like, yeah, they were like, they were sort of petty, and there's this character called uh, Kugel the Clever, and there was like a lot of pettiness that I thought was hilarious in his books with these, uh, you know, there'd be Yukonu, the laughing magi uh, magician, and uh, all these weird characters, and um, there was like less, like their issues were, were more ego-based and less based on like the coming of the next great evil that's going to, you know, mm -hmm. um, and they had all sorts of secret knowledge, but they, uh, so anyway, that was kind of a germ where that, uh, of, of where that came from. And, you know, the fantasy writers that I liked were guys like, um, you know, China Mieville mm -hmm. wrote some really weird ones. And, uh, 
you know, obviously Gaiman and, uh, you know, Joe Abercrombie, uh, you know, very much cut from the, the George Martin cloth was someone who I really admired his, the first law series and uh, uh, best served cold. I loved uh, Richard Morgan who did the, he's got this Netflix show on now called um, Altered Carbon, mm -hmm. wrote these great fantasy novels that I really dug. And um, so it was that, and like I'm a fan of, you know, comedy and things, and so those are sort of some of the, some of the guiding uh, uh, influences, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So did you, did you pitch this as a mini? Did you, I, how did? Uh, well, the idea was to keep it ongoing, and I, I, a lot of people, because it sort of ends, but like, Keeping up, I really wanted, you know, I guess I was swinging for the fences. I really wanted to put everything I could into it artistically. And so it's hard to grind out a, one of these a month, you sure, know? Sure, sure, sure. So I, it, I wanted it to be, I also felt that sometimes comics, they, like from my own reading, I'll go to a store and I'll buy like 30 issues of a series, but the series doesn't end. And I kind of felt like sometimes I'd like a series that has an ending, you know? Um, and I just knew that was more, I would be able to achieve that easier than promising a hundred year a hundred ep uh, episode uh, mm -hmm. epic mm -hmm. so I thought I would do it as a series of books mm -hmm. you know um, or a series you know there'll be another two or three volumes like this nice yeah awesome and so I have some ideas where to go although in between this I'm doing a, a switching gears to do kind of a sci-fi post-apocalyptic thing <coughs> because the sequel to Matrix had not been as fully cooked and my little binder of ideas had one in there that I really also, I almost did that first, you know, yeah, yeah. Uh, but I did Maestro's instead. So I'm doing that one next, and then I will come back to Maestro's. Nice. Yeah. Nice. I was hoping you were going to come back to it. Yeah. 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 I, a lot of people say, oh, I guess it's over, because what I tried to do with the last issue is have an ending. Yeah. But I, a lot of people were like, well, that pretty much seems like a conclusion for the series. Mm -hmm. I was like, well, wait a minute. There's more to go. Yeah. The next one will uh, be kind of fun, because in the Maestro's universe... Earth is like this magicless place. I tried to go against the trope. Earth is always like, you know, there's magic everywhere, mm -hmm. but we just, us, us muggles can't see it. Right. But instead it's kind of like the, the Khazars, the maestros, uh, where Earth is kind of like their sea monkeys. You know, they decided to create a place that didn't have any magic. Uh, no one could wield it, so that, just to see what would happen. And so Earth is sort of this anomaly in the infinite realms where it's the only place that doesn't have wizards. Right. You know, we, it's, it's made its way into our pop culture and the kind of cosmic consciousness. There's an awareness of magic and it's in our mythology and stuff, but we don't wield it here. And uh, yeah, I thought that would be kind of, kind of fun. And, uh, but in the, the follow-up, what's going to happen is uh, Willie, now that he's the maestro, decides to come to Earth and reveal the true history of Earth and that there is magic and he's going to give magic to the Earth to solve all our problems and it doesn't work out that way. Right. Everything bad happens. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I know. can see that. Um, when you pitched this, did you did you pitch How did that, go? that length of it or, or I think just it, the germ? I think it was, you know, it's a couple paragraphs, you know, like mm -hmm. uh, the, the maestro is dead. It goes to his uh, banished human son from the, the, the maestro throne and all the power of the greatest wizard in existence goes to his banished human son from Orlando, Florida. Mm -hmm. That was basically mm -hmm. what it was. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I sort of said it'll have kind of like, I really love the Evil Dead movies. I'm kind of a very squeamish person when it comes to like true crime stuff. But I love, you know, I can eat, you know, pizza and lasagna while I'm watching the goriest Walking Dead or, or, or Evil Dead shows. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to have that kind of comedic horror vibe in yeah, it, yeah. you know? Um, so that was in the in the pitch, but uh, yeah, short and sweet. Yeah. And image is just like, hands off. Yeah, it's like, I mean, you only have to pass Eric at that moment in time, right? Yeah, yeah, basically, if he says, yeah, sure. Yeah. And we stand on guard, obviously. Brian was in, involved, so it was a huge hit. So mm -hmm. they were, I don't know, he was very cool and let me just go for it. And mm -hmm. yeah, they were very supportive of the book and pushed it. So. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Image. Yeah. No, Image is a, it's a great model. It's a great model for the people who can work with it, you know? Yeah, yeah, um, definitely. You definitely, you know, you got to be your own boss and really want to sit down there and, and sure. do it. And, uh, you know, I've definitely wasted some hours. Uh, but, yeah, it's the most fun I've had doing anything. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. 
Nice. Definitely. Uh, I seem to recall it was originally a f six issue series and it got extended to seven. Yeah, that's the thing is um, you have your idea and you, th you got your like signposts along the highway where you think it's going to land. But, um, uh, but uh, yeah, then I get into it and I go, I don't have enough scenes. And then it just wound up going to seven issues and uh, yeah. they indulged me because a lot of the, you know, the first issue is like 34 pages and then it's like the second issue is 22 pages, which is where they want you to land. And then everyone after that is like 25, 26 pages and, right. you know, but, um, but yeah, they were cool. Yeah. yeah so. Uh, so that suggests to me that you didn't storyboard out the whole thing. Well, I wrote it out. I wrote how the okay. story was, but then, you know, you get to the issue, uh, you get to each extra, and it's, that's what I mean by signpost. You know, this has to happen. Mm -hmm. There's going to be this moment, and, uh, you know, you've got, you know, your arc of your character is going to wind up here, yeah. and, but how many pages is that exactly? You don't, for me, anyway, I've been, I had trouble figuring out, you know, 100 pages ahead exactly. Sure, Because sure. you sort of have to, like, if you, most guys who write a novel will tell you, oh, well, I, or a script, I wrote it and then I went back to the beginning and I revised it. It's harder to do, to do that in a comic because you've got to draw it. Yeah. So you yeah. you kind of like, I'm pretty sure this is how I want the first one to go. And then as I'm drawing the first one, I've got, I'm figuring out the second one and I'm looking at the third one and I've got a couple ideas for the fourth one. And so then I'm going and, you know, you know, but yeah, basically I'm just constantly working on it. I'll draw the pages during the day and then I'll sit on the couch with my wife and, you know, we'll be watching, you know, whatever she wants, because I'm just tr trying to figure out the next issue of Maestros, mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. yeah. But, uh, but yeah, I, I dug it. Yeah, yeah. So uh, issue by issue, your process is, are you, are you storyboarding or you know, doing thumbnails? So actually, hand me, hand me, I'll show you yeah, what I do. absolutely. There's the bag, always want to see what you do. We should have, uh, Plug this into the stream. Can you see this? Too late, probably. Yeah. I'll hold this up. So this is oh, what I'm. Paper this, book. this is my paper. This is, this is where it starts. Yeah, this is where it starts. And so it's just notes, <clears throat> mm -hmm. things that I like, right? Things that I like here, and uh, ideas for scenes, bits of dialogue. A lot of it'll be just thrown away. And then I have this process where I just kind of like lay post-it notes on top of old stuff that I'm revising. And then it kind of becomes like, um, you know, like the, uh, what's her name in Homeland, where it looks like a crazy person's, uh, you know, there's like, should be like red thread all over the, mm -hmm, my house mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. stuff. And so like, yeah, here are the pages and uh, little bits of dialogue. And then I'll get, these are all the, this is all for one issue. And so this will just keep getting revised and revised until... I get over here, and then I got. See down here, I'm figuring out what's going to go into this, these. How, how many pages I have for each scene that I have an idea for, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, more and more until I get to this stuff, and I've got dialogue written. And then I'll work, and I'll do this over a couple different sketchbooks. So I'll have this one, and then I'll have another one here that I'm kind of going back and forth between them. And I'm sure there's a better way to do this. Mm -hmm. There are the uh, you know, the process of learning how to tell these stories, I've spent a lot of time like reading books or you watch the online tutorials and they talk a lot, a lot about using these, these cards for scenes. And I've tried that and like I wind up using like 10 cards, you know, for like one little scene. I'm like, well, how do you, how do you just put, put it all in one card? I, mm -hmm. I couldn't figure it out. But um, anyway, there you go. That's how the sausage is, my sausage is made anyway. Yeah. <laughs> And then my son came in. I had all these. Uh, here's some more. One, especially this page here. I I just started taping them together, and these are some some dialogue pages that. Nice. And I'm just looking at my son, and he's got one of these crumpled up in his hands. And I'm like, well, where did you get that? <laughs> so it it looks like you're you're sort of approaching these from a word first. Uh, word and picture, more like, I'll start like shot of, you know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, close up of this and then maybe a line of dialogue mm -hmm. and then, uh, yeah, I'll start with just doing a shot list, a shot of this, a shot of this to tell the story with dialogue that comes to me 
that kind of you know bridges the images, and then I'll just re revise as I go. Mm -hmm. oh, I need this, and and then I'll just try to try to have reveals on page turns if I can. Mm -hmm. That's really tricky. Um, but I'm also thinking of you know I'm combining images sometimes yeah. and using composition to trying to. Like you'll notice, like sometimes I'm not doing a lot of tight close-ups, mm -hmm. which you see maybe in a lot of books, because I'm sort of saving those for like key, more important moments, or mm -hmm, you know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Anyway, doing my best to get as much mileage out of those uh, inches, yeah, as possible. And are you are you thinking about uh, things like page turns purely in terms of um, the periodical? release or are you thinking about it in terms of how it's going to paginate into well, a book right because because the well the pagination yeah. is the same right well that's what i thought i wondered that but actually they all land oh do they okay. they do all all the all the all the i'll show you my yeah. the one where it was really important to me to get the right one to land was uh in issue two where we go from the kiss and you're like oh romantic moment mm -hmm. to like the dream image of like him being all ripped up right um, but sometimes I, I don't always nail it yeah but yeah well, good that it, it worked out because I yeah. know I know that but they all line up the same as in the uh, the floppies there have certainly been books though that where it didn't oh yeah I'm I've sure I've seen plenty in my well, life well I bet it's harder if it's a you know one of the big two books because sure, they've got commercials they've got ads, yeah, right? yeah you've got to, so it's hard to know yeah you got to get screwed around that yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, but uh, let's talk about the actual craft a little bit. You you showed me the iPad. Are you are you drawing digitally? Yeah, this is all digital. Okay. Uh, okay. I have been for a while. I got into that because of storyboards. Because you just there's so much <laughs> revision involved in that job where you know you will go to a meeting with your storyboards and they go, oh, I like this and that, but put this at the beginning and that at the this and this set has changed that uh, you need to work digitally or, or else you're like cutting and pasting all this stuff and it becomes you're just too slow so I got into that and uh, yeah I was reluctant at first because I was a paper guy for so long and uh, it was a bit of torture uh, so I had like buyer's remorse for this big expensive Cintiq for like three months and then finally you click and you get used to drawing on this plastic and you get used to using all the Photoshop shortcuts and uh, yeah it's a lot um, you know now I now I can't draw without it mm. I've wondered if it's screwed up my eyesight because I can't even uh, drawing on paper it's just like you know I need to hold my iPhone flashlight up to it now you know right right you know because I now I just kind of zoom in on things yeah which is the other challenging things, because sometimes things are just too detailed. Like I'll zoom in on a panel, and I'll be having a great time noodling up this thing, and then I'll zoom out, and I'll be like, "What did I just do? No one is ever going to see that," you know. But um, but yeah, generally speaking, it's uh, more advantage than disadvantage for sure. Yeah. Well, this is one of the questions I wanted to ask you too, in terms of craft, is that you are a noodler. You 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 do all this really kind of intense detail and I love it yeah I think it's fantastic I I'm I, trying to I'm trying to do it a little less like that's the problem with like in my artistic DNA obviously Darrow super mm -hmm. detailed guy mm -hmm. and Otomo and Michael Golden mm -hmm. uh, these guys are all great at, at detail but their real strength is composition mm -hmm. you know and uh, that's something I think about a lot uh, that I try to emulate but uh, yeah, there are definitely times where I've spent done just a little too much. You sure. Know? And um, yeah. I wonder sometimes about the difference between cartooning and this style. I don't even know what, what do we call this kind of detailed style? Does it have a separate name? It really doesn't, does it? Uh, you know, bad uh, model for making a ca uh, profitable comic, probably. That's <laughs> what it is. But. Uh, well, it's funny because I consider myself kind of cartoony. Mm. Like my characters and stuff, I really mm -hmm. work hard on having, you know, cartoony expressions mm -hmm. and things mm -hmm. like that. But I just like to have, uh, you know, a lot of depth and yeah, detail. Yeah. I just feel like it helps, you know, sell. I guess it's working in film. Uh, you know, those are a lot of questions that are 
being asked all around you, like, you know, what is the environment like? What are they doing in, the, in that space? You know, how does that space inform the story? And so, like, those are little things that I'm, I'm kind of thinking about. So, yeah, so when I'm in this book process, it's a lot of fun coming up with those ideas. And then you sit down to draw them, and it's like, oh, wow, it's noon, and I've got one panel done, and I should have, like, mm -hmm. four or mm -hmm. something. But, uh, but I don't know. I guess I'll... So... A question I've always had for this detail style is what's the difference for you between the forest and the trees I suppose like in terms of the language of comics to me is 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 a lot of where the eye goes through the page like the page is the unit right it's not the panel is the unit mm -hmm. But, but for a detail style like yours, a lot of it really becomes down to the panel. Does that, is, I don't think I phrased that. Well, I think I know what you're talking about is like, again, I think it comes back to composition and how are you, you're using composition to tell um, little moments of story. Yeah. I feel like, yeah, a lot of the times I could probably just cut half of that detail or 90% of it and it would still resonate and read fine right and i feel like probably when you're reading a comic book uh you don't say because i know i don't spend too much time looking at stuff i mean sometimes you do you but i i don't know just a, as an artist i sort of fetishize those those little lines the rendering i like to design little objects that are in the background and uh you know all these like fun things in the world but uh yeah i'm sure you could there'd be a, a faster i before starting my new project, I I played with this idea that I would do this simpler version of it that I tried to do, but I didn't quite work out. But um, but there's always hope. Who knows? Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, I love the detail. I guess my question is 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 when you're when you're in the thumbnail stage and the before you start drawing stage. I'm not thinking about detail at all. It's well, I'm not right. thinking that's, about. Well, that's, what, that's what I'm asking. Is the page? Is it the page of the Z? It how your eye flows on it or mm, it's more it's more you're thinking about where the balloon's going to go mm, okay. uh, because you're reading so you're left still to thinking right about it in terms of a dialogue it, to a certain extent yeah definitely because if you have your characters because that'll screw up your story if they're not talking at the right time <laughs> um, so thinking about that I'm thinking mostly about the individual frame and what's happening in it and what's you know what's being conveyed you know what what's the acting of the characters their expression you know what's the best you know expression uh that can sell an idea what's what's in the background what's behind them in the frame um that can sort of you know help flesh out the world what would be cool you know that kind of mm -hmm. stuff mm -hmm. and um uh, yeah, but I really try to make it clear. Like, I mean, there are definitely times where I've had a couple too busy panels. But even though it's detailed, uh, I try. I'm trying to have make sure that like you can just look at it and you can understand it, yeah, at totally. least in color. No, I, yeah. I very much feel like yeah. it. It works. Um, I can keep babbling, as we all know. I'm very good at babbling. But I'd love to turn to you guys in the audience and see if you guys have any questions to break this up, please, Michael. Yeah, sure. Um, thank you. I'll really enjoyed the humor in this and oh, awesome. you talk about the page turns I, I very much noticed that in reading this there were a lot of very fun reveals and that was part of the humor oh, cool. of the story uh, so thank you first cool and then I did notice there was so much detail it's really fun is there anything particularly exciting that you are happy about that you put in into this into my show so like hmm. make sure people see this hmm that I put into the book well I feel like you know I've I've just brought a level I don't think there were as many erections in fantasy <laughs> until I got involved in this, in this genre. Um, what did I put in here? <laughs> yeah. We're talking about it. We're getting some, some talking to some printers. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think the thing I like most about it is just like it's, you know, um, it's just, it's me. And uh, there isn't the, when you spend a lot of the time uh, working in, in film, I mean, you're really there to, uh, um, you know, to realize someone else's vision, you know, and uh, to get on board with what they want and uh, 
that's great. It's you know those those are have been fun jobs. But uh, the great thing about doing Maestro is what I uh, is I got to do whatever I wanted. Um, and even if you're working on like the big tour with a collaborator in comics, there's just a lot more freedom. Um, I remember in the old days, you know, I would get hot under the collar working at Marvel or something because they'd want a little change. And now, you know, I look back when you when you get into doing artwork for like games or movies or any of these things like that's basically your job is to change things until your boss says okay it's right or good enough to hand off to the next person and so yeah so i say yeah just kind of every page really is something that i'm i'm glad i got to i got to do um yeah and i liked uh yeah that's well, that's the way creative work should yeah. be ideally right is the you yeah, you're thrilled and you're happy by it as you're doing it, you know. Yeah, you know. Yeah, definitely. I'm just, uh, yeah, just, just. Uh, I w it was just, just a pleasure to work on. It was a lot of work, and uh, you're constantly chasing the deadlines. You're never getting enough done. But uh, you know, it's like one of these things. Like, yeah, in some movies, like at the end of it, you're just like, ugh, I don't even want to look at it. But you know, with this stuff, you know, I, I was always happy to like. I would always be like, you know, looking at it on my iPad when I was sitting at home and, and thinking about it. And it was just a fun world to visit and to do all this stuff in. And, uh, you know, it's scary at the beginning because I had never really done this much work on my own before. I had written a Wolverine story once, but, you know, uh, and drew it at Marvel. It was my last thing I think I did at Marvel. But uh, you know how that's going to, how Wolverine's supposed to act. You know how that universe works. You're super familiar <coughs> with it. Um, and you're also talking about an eight, twelve-page story, probably, right? Oh, it was four issues. Oh, was it? Okay, yeah, okay. But yeah. uh, but it's still like you know, it's like you you. It, this was like from out of nowhere. So there'd be like all the, what's this going to be? What's all these choices that are coming at you, and are they going to be good or bad? And it was it felt good to kind of uh, meet that challenge and uh, you know kind of really. Challenge, challenge myself to figure out this world and uh, feel like it was satisfying and cohesive to me and hopefully other people. Yeah, so long-winded answer. Follow up, Michael? Um, yeah, very quick follow up on that. When you talk a lot about, and obviously you have a lot of experience with film, but can you imagine this or any other projects becoming a film? And how would you feel about that process? Oh, like, yeah, honestly, I'd be, that'd be cool. I mean, um, you know, uh, if showbiz came knocking tomorrow, would I sell out? I mean, sure, if they were cool, um, you know, that's like extra money that keeps me in the comics game, you know what I mean? Like, uh, if someone wanted, wanted to make a TV show uh, that was that was good, I mean, I'd be cool with it. And you have to be kind of open, you have to understand that this is like, if someone wanted to make a TV show, it's going to evolve away from this because this is only seven issues. We've got like, I don't know, maybe an hour and a half film out of it, but uh, longer than that, I think. You think so? Yeah. Yeah. So, something like that. Um, yeah. So maybe. Yeah. But there's a, a lot more has to be um, done to it. But uh, yeah, I'm 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 cool with that. If something like that were to were to happen. Please, please. Uh, so you mentioned, you know, kind of learning how to draw from Darrow perspective, sight lines, all this yeah. sort, of, sort of stuff. Uh, as well as the influences like the tone and things like that. But how, how, how did you learn how to write, or, or who were you drawing from for writing, especially this, you know, being your, your, your own thing? Um, was it just in learning how to storyboard out other people's stories, or was it reading books, or...? or I think it's all, all of the above, really. Uh, making up your own story, really, I think you just have to... And this is really just all stuff that I've heard. Uh, that resonated with me, that kind of helped me get a little bit of confidence to keep me going, where like, um, you know, you have to make a story that you really want to see, you know, something that excites you. Um, if you're interested in doing a genre, read up on that genre and develop opinions about it. Like in the fantasy genre, I've read a lot of fantasy and like, these are the magical systems I like, these are the ones I don't like, I don't like, you know, and just have like, I can, you know, talk about that for a while, you know, but what I don't like about this fantasy or what I, what really grabbed me in this thing. And those, those are kind of um, shape my opinion of the tropes that, that kind of build the genre, you know. Um, 
And I always like Neil Gaiman always has this really great little piece of advice where he says, the one thing that you've got going for you that uh, no one else has, that no one else will ever have is yourself, you know, your own personality, you know, and just kind of go with that. And uh, that was, I really liked, uh, liked that one. And uh, yeah, and I'm constantly, you know, listening to, uh, you know, I bought those books. I bought the Robert McKee, uh, How to Screenwriting book, and I tried to read it, and I'm reading all these things, and he's breaking down every fucking element in the thing, and it's like, I can't, is this a beat? Is this a, you know, and I'm trying to figure out all this shit. And, uh, and then I read this article with John Milius, who is one of my, you know, when I was a kid, part of my cinema DNA were like the Conan the Barbarian movie, you know, and uh, I still watch that kind of regularly. But he was, he's, he was talking about that exact same thing, and he said that, he said, I didn't know what a character arc was. I didn't know what a, this was or all these things that they, these, these, I mean, they're helpful, for, they're helpful as well. But he just said, I just wrote a story, you know. And I kind of like the way he put that. So I guess it's go with your gut is a good, good part of it. And, uh, you know, I was kind of okay with no one liking it, too, like, uh, you know, again, the one thing that helped me with working in uh, movies and stuff, you're working on uh, for other people, is that uh, I wasn't really, at a certain point, I wasn't afraid anymore if it would be considered crappy or not because, hey, at least I got to do it. And that was kind of more important to me than it failing, you know, at a certain point. So mm -hmm. that's, if I learn how to write, that's my long-winded way of, that's how I know what little I do, I guess. Love it. Follow up? Um, well, I mean, given how diverse your, your work history is, films and, and comics and stuff, uh, for those who, you know, do want to make their own comics at some point, uh, do you think it's good to, to be that, that, to just go and do lots of different things? Or do you think it's best to really just focus on comics since you found your way out of it and then, you know, really needed to get back to comics. I would say just uh, this, you know, the thing about advice, especially for me, is like, I don't, this is just my opinion. I don't really know what anyone should really do. I have no, you know, one true way of doing things. But, uh, you know, if I could go back, I would probably have wanted to do more comics. And I look at some of these movies I've worked on that were never made, and that's a graphic novel's worth of, of art that could have been a book, you know? And I think that um, if anything, you know, uh, try to look for a path for yourself. You know, like, you know, sometimes, you know, there's financial reasons you got to make a living. So maybe you'll do work for hire for a while and you'll do, but you really, you know, you'll write, you know, I don't know, you know, Powerpuff Girls for, for a while or something, anything you can get. And then, but you, what you really want to do is, you know, uh, you know, steampunk romance or something, you know or whatever um, so yeah try not to be try to be flexi flexible and uh, you know you know like the Bruce Lee line you know like be like water you know try to like go with see what's coming at you and see if you can kind of like find a path for yourself that gets you a little closer to what you're interested in doing you know I how, think how a, important do you think it is to work on your own comic to own the trademark that whole part of it? Uh, I think that's super important. Uh, it's a little tougher. I mean, like I said, you know, to do maestros and the thing I'm doing next, it's like less money. But, you know, if you can find a way to do it, I think it's valuable. I mean, in other ways, you know, Creator Own has paid off very well, too. Um, but there's no guarantees. You're kind of like, you know, the prospector up there mining for gold in a way. You know, it's like there's no guarantee you're, you're going to do it, so you can't make that the reason. But I think for your soul and maybe, uh, you know, maybe down the line, it might be uh, for, there might be financial gain as well. But, uh, I, but, and, but mostly for creatively. I mean, doing your, that's how you're going to develop your own voice and, do your own thing and uh, you know like this is very different than my Wolverine story yeah. you know you know there was like uh, I don't think Marvel would have allowed uh, any you know male enhancement potions in Wolverine yeah. you know can so you, can you go back to doing work for hire at this point um you know what probably I mean I'm gonna try to keep this going but I wouldn't uh, 
But I'm also like a big nerd. I still love all that stuff. Sure. You know, so like I'm always buying Marvel <laughs> comics and right. DC comics and reading them. And, right. you know, I'll sit here and have a two hour conversation on, uh, on, you know, Frickin', you know, what Zack Snyder did wrong in the Batman versus Superman or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't Batman's costume look good, though? Uh, sort of. Yeah, I yeah. know. But, uh, like, one of the best movie projects I ever worked on was George Miller did this uh, Justice League film mm. that never got made. And so I got to go down to Australia for like five months, and I'd never drawn the DC characters. And it was just like, they thought it was a little weird. I was a little too into it, I think. But, you know, everyone's sitting around and they'd be these big meetings and we're just talking about, you know, he, there's a couple guys who are his uh, comic nerds and I was there. I was one of the, the uh, you know, anointed in the comic book world and we would sit there and just have these long conversations about Batman, Superman, Wonder Woman and what their powers are. And it, it would be funny because you would have like, you'd get his perspective on it and you, you would have epiphanies like, you know, they kind of all have the same powers, don't they? And you'd be like, huh? What do you, that's, that's not true. Superman's not the same as the Flash. He's like, well, they all go fast. At that point, Wonder Woman could fly. Right. Green Lantern flies. Martian Manhunter and Superman are the same. Because they were trying to figure out how to, you know, individuate them on screen and make mm -hmm. them have their own little moments. And, uh, yeah, so it was sort of, it was challenging. But, uh, yeah, I, I, I geeked out. So, yeah, I could do, I could do it again. I mean, obviously, this is the most fun. But, sure. uh but yeah, I got a uh, yeah. I got also my little st stack. I've got my Batman story and I'm uh, of things I've never done. My Batman story and another Wolverine story and all okay. that stuff. So, nice. but we'll see where that goes. I mean, sure, 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 sure. You know, Miles, you had a question. Uh, yeah, you mentioned games earlier. Um, did you work on games? I didn't work. I have. Have I worked on any games? Oh yeah, I've done some storyboards for some games in Vancouver. Um, one of the driver games like it's one of these things where like you know i don't even remember it you know what i mean that that's the kind of thing it was or like okay well in movies it's very similar because they needed storyboards for the animatics so it's more or less you know the cutscenes in between your gameplay so it's story stuff so it's more or less the same less revisions you're not on it as long it's yeah it was pleasant for the most part i did some commercials as well and those were a lot of fun because they were super short and commercials have like lots of money so you can draw i did a halo commercial once um and some something else for some cell phone that had like and that was pretty cool you know um but but yeah, I mean, comics, you get to be an artist. Even if you're working at the big two, I mean, everyone's doing their best version of whatever it is, you know. If you're on Superman or Batman, everyone's kind of living their dream. So that's the big difference. Also, uh, George Miller, like Living Dead George Miller, he was doing Justice League? In Fury Road, George Miller. You know, oh, yeah, the yeah. Mad Max. Uh, Mad Max George Miller, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Mad Max. Lorenzo's Oil, George Miller. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. It, was, it would have been, uh, it wouldn't have had the cold heart of the Zack Snyder movie, but I don't know if it would have been the fans' version either. He, mm. he, would, he had a, a lot of effort in trying to make it. Uh, it wasn't really weeding y was i don't know it was kind of weird it was kind of cool though they had some amazing action scenes in it ultimately it became too expensive um but uh it had to do with like the the superheroes were all around anyway everyone had their own careers and knew who each other were but they just never teamed up before and so they just kind of like an event happens where someone tries to kill them all and uh, uh you know i think it was based on the omac story that maybe Greg Rucka had written mm -hmm. one and <laughs> Batman had like figured out how to kill everybody and someone stole that info and tried to do it and there was like um uh, Power of Battle, right? I can't I, I can't yeah. remember whatever it was yeah but there was like Maxwell Lord was the villain in it and he was going to be oh, played by Jay Baruchanel do you know oh, that guy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so he was like played as this much younger kind of dorky yeah. fan of the superhero right, 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 right. he was basically uh, almost the same character uh, but without the costume as the villain in um, 
the Incredibles movie, someone who idolized them, yeah. Syndrome, someone who idolized them but hated them at the same time. Right, right, right. And so he was, you know, this big industrialist, but he also owned a chain of those Kingdom Come restaurants. Right, right, right. And in every burger, there was like some nanotech poison that would like, you know, at the flick of a switch, turn you into this uh, mechanical monster. And so the Justice League, you know, the entire world gets infected because these hamburgers are so popular. So the Justice League, how, how do we fight them? But we can't kill them. Right. Um, so it was one of those things. But it was really funny. Aquaman had, at that point, he had the water hand. Uh-huh. Um, which was like, that was the other thing I think killed it is the costumes weren't so great. Because they tried to get everyone's costume for kind of a budget. Mm-hmm. Uh, so who was in it? No one really went anywhere. The only big star guy out of there who became a big star was the guy who was going to play Batman was this dude, Army Hammer, who yeah. was, who's around now. Yeah. And I got a bunch of pics of these guys in their outfits and stuff. It's pretty funny. And then, funny. And then they had Weta doing the costume designs, yeah. and they did this beautiful design of uh, Martian Manhunter. Like he's tall and he's slim and he's kind of got this alien anatomy that's... Like, just the sexiest version of Martian Manhunter you've ever seen. And then they cast, George Miller cast, the guy who was uh, Immortem Joe in Fury Road, who was oh, okay. also the, who's now an older, heavier set man. Yeah. Uh, and then you look at the maquette, and then they put him in this, like, green foam outfit. And right. they, he kind of looked like, you know, if the thing had the flu. Huh. <laughs> well, it can't be any worse than David Ogden Steyer in the, in the Justice League pilot oh. that got filmed. <laughs> it was, mm, you know... It wasn't that bad. They'd, they'd obviously spent some money, but um, but it wasn't. Uh, maybe it was better that it uh, didn't get made. But it, was, it had some cool stuff in there for sure. Common was going to be Green Lantern. Oh, that would have been cool. Yeah, he was a good choice. That would have been cool. Um, the, I can see that. The Flash was the guy with. I always forget his name. He was on Dawson's Creek. One of the guys on that show, mm-hmm. and uh, not him. Who was the guy under him? There's another guy in there. <laughs> he's like this guy who's like never wor- never worked again, but he's like always has a show that doesn't get picked up, <laughs> but but has like been getting paid for like years. Sure, sure, sure. You know, um, not him, but the other one. Other other guy. The other other guy. <laughs> Isn't there one? Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it's not that show, but uh, I'm pretty sure it's Dawson's Creek. All right, so uh, Well, Supergirl doesn't have the money, but, uh, you know, probably better on Supergirl than... I'm sure they would have made him look better, but he was like, you know, compared to this design that Weta had done, uh, it was pretty badass. But, um, yeah, I don't know what else to tell you about it. It was... uh, I don't know. They had a funny... There was a funny scene in it, um, I I told you earlier where like they're at the Fortress of Solitude and in this version, you know, you've got the ice uh, mountain or whatever and it's, he's got his, it's a little closer to the comics where you've got his trophies around, but he's also chosen to recreate his, the farm, the Kent farmhouse within the the Fortress of uh, Solitude, which, uh, so it's just this house, regular kind kind of, uh, you know, um, country house. And so the superheroes like Aquaman, Green Lantern, and Martian Manhunter have been poisoned by the nano whatever, nanobots. And so they're, they're recovering and they're getting their powers back. And so then Green Lantern sort of creates a guitar for, uh, a green guitar for like, I don't know, uh, one of them to play like either him or, or Martian Manhunter. And yeah, I think it's Martian Manhunter and he's playing it. And then like a couple more, you know, what do you call those, you know, the stock or whatever, the handle. And then Marshall Manhunter grows a couple more arms and he's playing it. And then Aquaman, the Green Lantern, goes and shoots out like this um, saxophone. And so he's, you know, Aquaman is playing the saxophone and then like uh, <laughs> Green Lantern creates like some keyboards and uh-huh. he's doing this. And then they create like, you know, the, the whole fucking live aid right. audience is out there. And then they create the giant speakers. And then like, you know, and the sequence ends with like, them having this concert where they're rocking out with these giant speakers, which I think he kind of used in Fury Road with the guy mm-hmm. hanging on the bungee. Mm-hmm. And so they're all rocking out. And I remember looking at that going, huh, 
I don't know. <laughs> it, it still sounds better than the Snyder version. Right? Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm just saying. I'm just saying. All right, let's pivot back to the comic, though. Sure. Because that's, that's, those are great stories, but... Um, Thought you'd appreciate those. Yeah, guess. no, I do. Uh, the I think the last thing I want to talk about is color. Let's talk about. Oh yeah, I'm sorry, I've not mentioned and, my collaborators. And my Dave Stewart and the genius Dave Stewart. Yeah, like, so so lucky to have him on. How there. does how does how did you get him to work on it first? Uh, Darrow. Okay. I called Darrow and I are, are good friends and we chat all the time and <laughs> he works on um, his thing and I. You know, I tried to get him for We Stand on Guard, but he was but he was busy. Not to not to Matt Hollingsworth is a great um, was was great on that book. He's fantastic. But I felt that he was already doing the other big fantasy, the Seven to Eternity, mm -hmm. and Dave has just like he knows how to you know. There's a lot of depth in there, and he just knows how to not overcolor. He just he just lands perfectly. He just has great color choices and has an amazing palette and just knows how to, he brings drama and depth and and character to everything he colors and he really is probably the best guy in the business and uh, so, you know, we, Darrow kind of introduced us and, you know, we, we worked out the details and uh, yeah, he was on board and hopefully I can still keep getting him to, to color me. But yeah. Uh, yeah, that was a real blessing. And phonographics, uh, Stephen Finch, you know he does Brian's, uh, he does Saga, and a bunch of other other books, and he's amazing and almost like a an editor in a way, kind of keeping the the train running smoothly. That was the other thing that was really hard is I had to be kind of the 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 sort of steer the ship as it were and like remember deadlines and stuff. And I sort of suck at that. And mm -hmm. uh, Stephen was great at that, and he has an amazing design sense. I mean this logo that he created, I'm like so grateful for that. I think he did such an amazing job with that. And uh, yeah, he figures out ways to squeeze in my a couple a couple times. You know, when you're a new writer, the thing to remember with comics is it's like less is often more. You know, and uh, you know it's really easy to overwrite. Sometimes you'll look at a guy, I'll look at a comic, and there won't be a lot of words there. I mean, that's not really easy. If the, if you read the comic and feel like it's entertaining, uh, it's a lot of restraint and a lot of tough choices to get something boiled down to be, you know, um, coherent and entertaining and flow well, and a lot of moving back and forth. I work really hard trying to get that dialogue to fit. I mean, there's definitely a few pages where like I overdid it. I wish I had pruned a little bit more. But uh, yeah, but Stephen was really good at squeezing all that in. Into the uh, into the panels when uh, when it was uh, maybe over overwritten here and there. Did you have an editor per se on the book? Mm, no. Not really. No. Yeah. No. Just just uh, you know, Image has when when you get the ball gets rolling and you're going to the print and these books are coming out. Image has uh, a, a lady to let you know who your where your deadlines are, and hopefully you write those down somewhere, and hmm. uh, you know get them done. Right. But you know we blew it in the last couple of issues. I we had like my new. You know, we had a baby, and then we had a surprise pregnancy, and then my little baby, when he got was born, was sick, and but now he's he's fine now. But uh, at that time, it threw the last two issues just like totally off schedule. Right. But uh, but hopefully the next one will land them. Yeah, it also yeah. doesn't feel like you went so far off schedule that anyone noticed that much, honestly. Well, know? a lot of books go off schedule, yeah. so, so yeah. yeah, it was more important. I feel like yeah, I did still was able to com complete it with the. The best I could I could do. Yeah. So in terms of the lettering, um, you know, we were talking earlier about how a lot of your process kind of starts with the words and figuring out how that flows on the page. So I'm guessing that as you're drawing it, you have a fair idea of, of where the space is for the for the word balloons. Yeah. Yeah. I basically have. Uh, a first or second pass on the dialogue done when I'm drawing it, and I'm trying to leave enough, and hopefully I'm leaving enough room. And then it's funny, you know, the longer you, you leave it and then you come back, you know, you can always carve a few more. I mean, sure, if you were, if it was dialogue in a movie or something, it wouldn't matter. But because you're squeezing it into this little space, yeah, it's like sometimes you're like just constantly looking for, you know, the shorter, you know, synonym or something, you know, to try to you know, make that balloon just a, a, a tiny bit smaller and hopefully, uh, you know, 
you've you've left I've tried to make sure that I you know am planning things out but you're writing and drawing at the same time so there's still a certain amount that's up in the air you know but uh, but um, yeah it's uh, like I landed most of the part. It gets better as you get near the end, I think. Okay. I get a little tighter with it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, yeah, issue two probably are the most chatty. Issue one's kind of chatty. Sure. But uh, but I felt I needed a lot of that, like the whole sequence where young Willie is, you know, the 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 curtain is pulled back by his father and he meets the infinite, sees the infinite realms. I felt like, I don't know, his voice was very clear to me and I was having a lot of fun mm -hmm. uh you know, expressing this guy who's almost, who's sort of part uh, Max von Sydow's Ming the Merciless and, um, you know, maybe uh, Sasha Baron Cohen's The uh, Dictator. Right. Yeah, yeah. Combined yeah. and meets, I don't know, someone else. Yeah. More is there, evil. is, so is there a push and pull for you as a creator between, because you're very detail oriented and you're putting a lot of detail on the panels, but then sizing those balloons. Well, I try to leave area, like I try to build the, the balloons into the compositions. <laughs> okay, so it's negative space to begin yeah. with, you're saying. Okay. Yeah, and I'll probably fill, spend too much time filling that up anyway, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. um, I can only think of one time where I really like, the writer and uh, artist part of me became enemies, like, if I, the writer part of me hated the art, you know, the artist part of me hated the writer part of me. There's this one scene where they go to this big chamber called the uh, Hall of Conquest and Torment. And I spent all this time drawing all this shit everywhere and uh, all these little details of, of this gigantic trophy room. And then I have this gigantic balloon where he basically explains all this stuff. And I couldn't not take that balloon out. Right. You know, I had to leave it in there. And uh, I think even Stephen Finch was like, ah, it's probably fine without that, all that. And I was like, no, this has to stay. Mm -hmm. So, but um, I don't know. Sometimes, you know, you got to go with just the lowbrow uh, joke. Sure. Instead of all that labored drawing. Sure, sure, sure. Sure. But, yeah. And, and then in terms of the color, because of your level of detail, do you feel... I don't know what's the right word. Do you feel pity for your colorist? I mean, do you know what I mean? Like, because it, it, it seems like coloring something like this is a level... See, that's why Dave, is, a, Dave yeah. is the master, because he understands how to work that depth. If you look at it, it's like, it's not overly color colored. Like, you look at some superhero comics, and it's all about, you know, just work the hell out of that bicep. <laughs> get that highlight on there. You know, it's all about that stuff. Whereas he is more about, you know, foreground. He knows how to separate the depth. You know, he knows how to make sure the interest, the parts that need to pop are popping, and the other stuff in the background is. So it's, for him, it's a lot about color choices and what kind of mood he's going for. I mean, this looks very much different than uh, Hellboy, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, but he's not uh, he's not over rendering. Like yeah. if you look, a lot of this is flat, right? Yeah, it's not. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but it's just like, but he came up with all this like cool turquoise and stuff mm -hmm. and uh, the red, yeah. Like it's not how I envisioned it at all. And then yeah. I saw it and I was like, wow, <coughs> I'm gonna keep my mouth shut from now on. Okay, so are you giving color notes? Uh, Initially I start? was. Yeah, Initially okay. I was and then I kind of, you know, like when it came to what the characters looked like, I had notes. Like Mardok has gray mottled flesh and uh, y you know, maybe, you know, I've got, I've got a few ideas about that. You know, Will's mother, I wanted her to kind of have that Gandalf vibe, so she's got the white. Mm -hmm. um, the maestro is very ostentatious, so there's a lot of gold in his world, and he kind of brought in the, the, the plat platinums and the, and the turquoise. So I had those kind of notes, but for the most part, Dave is just going for it and, yeah. and killing it better than I could, you know? Yeah. Was there any point where you're like, oh, no, I... This has got to be blue instead of... I'm, I, I One time in the first issue... Like one thing he did was, which was really cool, is he color coded everyone's magic. So everyone's magic has its own color, and I was very dumb. And like, there's a scene in the, in the beginning where um, Willie creates this column of fire and throws it, and you know, um, uh, Dave had chosen this sort of bluish turquoise for, you know, Will's magic. But I made him change this fire to like regular yellow fire, because then the next 
panel, he's he's shooting ice, and I wanted the contrast between those yeah. two things. And now I look back at it and I go, ah, I shouldn't have made him change that. I you know it would have been fine the other way. Right. But uh, you know he was patient with me. Yeah. Well, trusting your collaborators is a hard skill to learn in a lot of ways. Well, know? when you're lucky enough to get uh, you know Dave Stewart and and Stephen Finch, then I pretty much just yeah trust those guys now. Yeah. 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 Fantastic. Um, you said uh, that your next book's a science fiction book. Yes. It's, uh, it, can you tell? What sure. can you tell us about it? That My elevator pitch for yeah. it is a little bumpy right now. I haven't quite, you know, kind of uh, grind, you know, polished it so that I can get it out in a sentence. But it's basically it's a post-apocalyptic sci-fi adventure. It's a couple hundred years in the future. Everyone is dead. We're down to like one. You know, one percent of less than one percent of the original population of the Earth, and you know, people have sort of you know, we're, we're the setting of the story takes place in the American wasteland, and uh, initially the story begins with um, uh, it, it's about there's there's this secret mountain base, basically a hollowed out mountain that's this that was built by the American government in case the the end ever came. They could use this facility, this airtight facility, to rebuild the world or rebuild America if they had to. And it's got all these, you know, futuristic resources, and it's uh, it can house up to you know a hundred thousand people. And it was built for the heads of state and the best and brightest in the world. But when it when the end came, the best and brightest never really made it there. It was more just kind of the uh, the fat cats and the elites wind up in there. And rather than take on the mantle of rebuilding. You know, they just say, well, let's hang out in this, you know, posh mountain base and uh, play pickleball. And uh, that's what they do for a few generations. Is they just kind of, you know, chill out there. And then ultimately, one of their own kind of goes out into the wasteland and comes back. And he's like this Sven Gali and he has this vision and he's going to, we finally have to, you know, this is a couple generations later, this guy, this President uh, Hawksworth, I'm calling him now, self-appointed president, decides that we're going to rebuild the wasteland. And so he turns on all the industrial 3D printers and uh, the, um, uh, you know, all the manufacturing levels and, you know, creates the armies of, of, uh, of drones and tanks that they're going to need to go out there and, uh, you know, flatten all the other uh, settlements that have grown up in America's place so that... Uh, he can rebuild the shining city upon upon the hill, you know, and uh, the story takes place within this mountain bunker. There's a working class of um, of maintenance people that kind of keep it running, <coughs> and they realize that they've been tricked, and this guy's nuts, and uh, you know they've thought that the air was poisoned this whole time, and they so they revolt, and there's like this sort of civil war, and uh, a couple of them escape and crash into the wasteland, and uh, this this one guy meets this kind of uh, bounty hunter um, girl and uh, they sort of team up and uh, there's a lot of crazy there's sort of superheroes in it but not really um, and yeah that's and that's basically it so far it looked like you had most of the first issue drawn first issue is done working yeah. on the second issue okay. and uh, yeah it's kind of about you know it's like it's kind of a a, a a pop culture kind of idea of uh, of America's, you know, what's the word? American vestments that have been like, l you know, left mm -hmm. on the, uh, you know, uh, left behind on the ground. Like everyone, like the the thing I wanted to do different was like a lot of post-apocalyptic stories are a little dreary. I mean, people aren't dying of radiation or any of that. This is it. Almost has a a, a sci-fi mythical vibe where like it's um, it's a, a the ruin of America is almost like you know if you're in, into Conan or something and you know there's all these you know the, the end of the Hyborian age and Conan is running through the city like Thundar or something like that is like it's not really like that but like there's an, an, a component in there and so it's like you know it's the world is green again um, People, people remember America and what it was, but it's sort of this thing they only know through, you know, the digital media that's been excavated, that's been laying around. People know of the movies from the old world, but no one makes that stuff anymore, you know? A lot of the 
people who are really smart don't, uh, you know, they all died. And so, like, if you have any kind of knowledge or whatever, that's kind of, uh, you're kind of like an important person for a settlement if you can get things working again. And, and then there's just like, you know, there are, there's cannibal cults. I've got this cannibal cult who are, I'm calling the followers of the path, and they run around and basically anyone who crosses their path, they eat them because the old world died because it kept consuming until it consumed itself, and they keep the balance. And there are these other roaming gangs who, you know, or trying to take over and rebuild themselves, but they all wind up collapsing somehow. And that's sort of the female protagonist of the story. That's her role as she basically uh, infiltrates these places and, and kills them. But that's not all she does. She also, you know, makes her own jam and sells that at uh, markets and stuff. So. Sounds good. Can't wait. Do we have a title? The working title right now is The American Wasteland. Okay. But uh, it might be different. I'm still trying to figure it out. Okay. And do we have a publication idea? Uh, coming soon, eventually. Okay. But uh, yeah, probably yeah, the next year. What's your sure. What's your production rate? Uh, how many pages a day can you do? Oh, ten. No, uh, I can do maybe. It depends. Like in Maestro's, like the double page spread there, that took me like five days. Wow. Okay. But you know, not every page is like that. I can do, you know, like. Depending on what the pages are, if there's three to uh, you know three to five, if they're not if they're more talky, mm -hmm. but then there are some heavy hitter pages that uh, that uh, yeah that, that will take forever. So I, you, so you need to get a full length ahead before you can start scheduling. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I want to make it you know high quality like yep. as much as I can like maestros and mm -hmm. and have all that uh, needless detail mm -hmm. that I can't seem to shake and. Mm -hmm. uh, and all the rest no, of it. you shouldn't shake. It's yeah. very good. Uh, and you said there's two more at least, Maestro? Yeah, I've yeah. Got, I got ideas for them. And, uh, you know, as I'm working on this, I'm, you know, also working on that in the, yeah. in the meantime. And uh, got a couple things in the cooker. And yeah. Yeah, hopefully I can just keep it going at image as long as possible. Yeah, nice. So the last question I wanted to ask about this, um, th this came out kind of during the Me Too movement. And I like to think that one of the themes of the book is toxic masculinity. To yeah. Toxic masculinity. Yeah, sure. But obviously, from the way that you produce, this is not reflective of the Me Too movement directly, right? Well, it's funny, yeah, because it's about... Uh, there's a line in there. I guess it was around the election I was drawing issue two. Like, one character, like, because he becomes the um, maestro. And then the old high council of... Uh, of uh, Zanon is like, they're all pissed because they've been booted out. And the one character says, I'm moving to Kanlada, you know, because everyone was saying they're going to move to Canada. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I guess it was on my mind a little bit. But it was, yeah, just kind of that idea of like, you know, the axiom is, you know, uh, ultimate power corrupts absolutely, right? Or ult mm -hmm. ultimately or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so, but it also, the more I kind of thought about it, it also, ultimate power also kind of, you know, uh, let's people define the terms of what corruption is and, mm. and everything else. And so that, kind of, that was kind of the idea with him is that his arc in it is he kind of goes a little bad at the end, you know? It's like hard to get rid of the, the book of remaking where you get, basically get to create the universe in your image. Um, that idea is kind of like, you know, that's, that's as much, that's ultimate privilege. You know, you get to make a bubble with you at the center and you know you're god now and you could do whatever you want and so you know in that kind of context you know what is good and bad you know mm -hmm. you get to decide so if you're a bast so what happens is his father is obviously an evil bastard but uh who knows what he was like when he started out mm -hmm. you know but uh you know he he gets to decide what good and bad is right mm -hmm. so and he's sort of challenging that so he starts off good he he, he comes and uh he emancipates all the magical lands and, and tries to be impose all these, you know, kind of social justice ideas in this world, and it drives all the powers to be crazy. But um, you know, who knows what path he's on before? You know, will he be able to realize when he's gone too far? You know, and it's hard. And you think of Trump up there at the UN, and he's like, 
we have accomplished more than any other administration ever. Mm -hmm. And everyone laughs, and he's shocked. He can't believe it. I mean, like, that, that guy, that's a bubble. He has no idea. He does not, he, he can't uh, relate. So he's, so, you know, who knows? Maybe that'll happen to Will. I mean, a lot of people have sort of criticized him as a character, saying he's not very likable. Mm. And uh, I guess he's, he, he's kind of, I don't know, I tried to do the old Stan Lee thing where I tried to make him a person that, uh, you know, was like real in some way. Mm -hmm. And like, I think that's kind of, re you know, he, he, he tries to do good things, but he, he's an ass a lot of the times too. Yeah. And I feel like, you know, people are, are like that. And you kind of got to, I just, rather than in fantasy, the other trope is like, they're always like so good. Like Harry Potter is such a goody two shoes and it's like hard for me to relate to him. Sure. You know? It's like, when, and especially when you've got the forces of creation at your fingertips and you're just going to be like, you know, awesome with that cloak of invisibility, you know, or whatever, yeah. you know, like, what would someone else do? Like, he's definitely not malevolent, yeah. but he's in a situation he needs to make, make money and he needs to do it on the download. So he starts doing sleazy things like yeah. the male enhancement potions and stuff are right out of Harry Potter, like the Weasley brothers and their little shop and yeah. like, you know, coming out of that with my friends and, you know, you know what they should really be selling there, you know, and uh, so yeah, toxic ma masculinity is, power was something I was thinking about, but yeah, for sure, yeah. for sure. Yeah, it just, it felt right at the moment. I think that's one of the reasons we connected to it, you know, so much. It happens, I guess, sometimes, you know, because, you know. Sure. I'm reading stuff and. You know, yeah, sometimes it's just steam swirling. Yeah, it's swirling around, and yeah. you know, very good. Any last questions from the room? No, we're good. Okay. Everyone's sick of hearing me talk. Huh, finally. No, 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 no. We're good. We're good. Um, I want to say we really love this book. Uh, if you're watching this on video, um, really go out and find a copy of Maestros. It's it's a terrific book. Yeah. <laughs> They, they agree. Um, Thanks so much. Uh, Thanks. Yeah, and 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 really, Steve, we want to see more work from you. You know, you're a, you're a vital creator uh, who's doing great stuff, and, oh, thanks. and we want to see more. Um, thanks, Brian. Yeah, Appreciate no, I'm, I'm, you got a great store. I love what you. you do. Yeah, yeah, right on. Um, I want to say that uh, next month, the January book uh, is a book called Lazaretto. Um, we will be having the meeting on January 23rd. Uh, it will be a video meeting, unfortunately, because one of our artists is in, I think it's Denmark. It might be Sweden. It, somewhere where I can't fly them from. Uh, so Clay McLeod Chapman is the writer. Jay Levang is the artist. We'll be doing a video meeting with them. Uh, and then uh, February, we have Alish Kott and Trad Moore. I hope. I hope Trad Moore. I hope. Um, I think so. And then March, we've got Tom King and Mitch Gerard. So Whoa. it's Whoa, so we we know we've got a really nice uh, lineup coming up for the next couple of months. Um, you're in you're in good company there with this book, Maestros. Uh, I want to thank Steve for coming out. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks I everyone. I thank the audience for coming out on a Wednesday night in the cold weather. I want to thank Jordan for doing our tech, Jordan. Uh, and I want to thank The Beat, as always, for sponsoring us and bringing us to a wider audience. And uh, if you're watching these videos, uh, you like the things that you see, please join the club at www.graphicnovelclub.com slash start. Um, and, uh, and you too can get these books as they're coming out, get our exclusive book plates, and be part of our live streams. Thank you very much for coming out. Uh, we'll have a great night, and this was the Comics Experience Graphic Novel Club for December. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.